I am happy to introduce our two speakers today, one who's here remotely. So we have Russ Suvarov from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and then Adolfo Carillo Cadeo from the University of Minnesota. And I'm guessing that they were in the same PhD program at the same time, because they both have PhDs from Iowa State in Applied Linguistics and Technology. And they are going to be presenting on their collaborative project entitled Development of Language Learner Autonomy and Adaptive Learning Systems. So please welcome Russ and Adolfo. Thank you everyone for taking the time to join us this afternoon. And um, I also would like to kind of give you a heads up. We're trying something new. Um, as you know, Russ is joining remotely. So if you see any issues with the connection, he's actually the host uh, for our screen. So if you see that sometimes it kind of gets slow, just bear with us. Um, our talk this afternoon is, um, as uh, Kate mentioned, a collaborative project um, that we did. Um, we started in the spring semester 2015. And uh, so that's what we're gonna be talking to you about. Uh, let me give a second to uh, Ross to introduce himself and just check his sound, make sure that we can hear him well, Ross. Uh, aloha from Honolulu. Uh, my name is Ross Suvorov. Uh, I'm a language technology specialist at the Center for Language and Technology and also the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, nice to be uh, virtually present. Okay, and the title of our talk is Development of Language Learner Autonomy in Adaptive Learning Systems. And what we thought to do, rather than give you a round down on all the literature review, we wanted to start out by telling you what prompted uh, this research project. So give you some background on how this all got started and then move forward telling you more about the study that we conducted and um, some of the results that we uh, found. So this all started out, as I mentioned, in the uh, spring 2015. Um, I was back then teaching at Iowa State University, Spanish, and in the fall semester 2014, uh, we adopted a new textbook for all the beginning uh, courses. And at the end of the semester, fall 2014, there were lots of uh, complaints from the students in regards to um, the, uh, the uh, textbook and the materials that accompany the textbook and kind of puzzled me to see that uh, there was variation in terms of the opinions that they had in regards to the newly adopted textbook. And so I wanted to find out more to what was triggering all of this confusion from the students. And so in, uh, I reached out to Russ and um, we realized that one of the uh, components of the ancillary materials for the textbook was an adaptive learning system and doing some uh, research on the literature about uh, these systems, we found out that there were no studies reported in the literature that have systematically uh, studied how these systems work once they are integrated into a curriculum. So that's what, how we uh, kind of set uh, the framework uh, for our study, uh, focusing on a systematic analysis and study of the adaptive learning system and in relation to the uh, curriculum and how it affects the student's performance in, in the class. So um, we started working on, on this project, uh, again, at Iowa State University, and we collected our data in spring 2015 uh, we reported uh, preliminary results at a presentation at, at the Calico conference in 2016. And then after that, we actually got uh, the article published in the 2017 Calico monograph on learner autonomy and web 2.0 and the references listed um, there. So, um, the first um, thing that we wanted to do, we wanted to make sure that we are all on the same page in terms of terminology. So we thought to start with telling you what we understand for adaptive learning system or what is understood uh, for an adaptive learner system. Uh, so these are Web 2.0 technologies and some of the uh, characteristics that uh, it has is that it adapts to the uh, previous performance of the user 
and it starts uh, bringing in new content adapted to what your previous responses were. Um, and this um, functionality makes it different from a, an intelligent tutoring system because the intelligent tutoring system do not uh, take into account the individual performance or past performances of the individual, uh, but rather work on algorithms uh, based on general trends of learners, as opposed to considering what feedback you provide to the actual uh, system. Uh, of course, they are computer-based system and they are designed just to adapt to individual needs of the user and they are able to measure students' progress individually, so keep a record of your actual activity within the system. Another definition that we wanted to make sure that uh, we uh, make clear on what we understand uh, for learner autonomy, since there are different dimensions and different frameworks, is, uh, is learner autonomy, and Ross will tell you more about that. Okay, thank you, Adolfo. Uh, so, uh, learner autonomy is a, is a concept that has been around for the past, I would say, almost 40 years. Uh, I guess starting with Holich's definition, uh, who defined learner autonomy as the ability to take charge of one's own learning. And the, um, the way the learner autonomy is understood has changed over the time. Uh, so, in our specific uh, study, we defined learner autonomy as the ability of learners to take control of their own learning in a socially mediated and technology enhanced language learning context. Um, so learner autonomy was initially conceived as a unidimensional concept uh, that basically focused on the individual uh, dimension that is learners responsibility for and control of their own learning. But with time, researchers added other dimensions, um, and namely the social dimension and the digital dimension of learner autonomy. Uh, the social dimension implies that uh, learners' uh, control of their learning does not happen in isolation. It, it is uh, affected by uh, interactions with other learners, uh, the teacher, and more, more importantly, the social setting. And the digital dimension has to do with the learner's uh, digital literacy. Uh, in uh, call, learner autonomy uh, can be influenced both by internal and external factors, and interestingly, when we were doing, uh, when we were looking at the literature on this topic, we found that um, lots of publications in uh, in various journals, such as Calico Journal, uh, state that uh, learner autonomy is one of the guiding principles for the design and creation of the call environments. However, we found very few studies that actually empirically investigate the development of learner autonomy in call environments. Um, so, in addition to the uh, concept of uh, the notion of the learner autonomy, we would, we would also like to talk about the theoretical, um, uh, the theoretical basis of our study. We used activity theory. Um, uh, it's a heuristic for exploring human activity as a multi-element system that is mediated by tools, driven by motive, governed by rules, and comprised of people. It, um, the, the theory was developed by Lev Vygotsky back in the 1930s in the Soviet Union, and then it was picked up in the Western literature uh, somewhere in the 70s, way past his death. And Engström was, uh, I think, specific, uh, particularly um, um, uh, important in promoting this uh, theory uh, in the West. Uh, so, an important element of an activity theory uh, is contradictions uh, between and among different elements that are believed to lead to changes, growth, transformation, and evolution of the activity uh, system. And uh, investigating uh, these relationships uh, among the different elements of an activity system, uh, according to Francois Blin, can help identify affordances for increased learner autonomy and gain insights into contradictions that prevent the uh, development of learner autonomy. Uh, this is a graphical representation of an activity system model. Uh, it consists of different elements, rule, subject, mediating tools, object, division of labor, and community. And the arrows uh, among the elements uh, indicate that there is a interaction among all the elements going on. And uh, uh, in this next slide, uh, 
we, sh we show you the um, language learning activity system of the participants in our uh, specific study. Uh, so let me uh, quickly walk you, walk you through this. So on the left side, you can see subjects. Uh, those are the individual students uh, who um, use uh, tools. Uh, in our case, it's adaptive learning systems at uh, the top of the triangle. Uh, the two adaptive learning systems that we uh, studied were Orion and Connect, and Adolfo will talk more about uh, those systems. So the, uh, the purpose or the object uh, for these individual students uh, on the right is to improve the vocabulary and grammar from textbook chapters in a Spanish class. Now this learning, the, the, uh, the achievement of this object uh, that is mediated through adaptive learning systems doesn't happen in isolation. The subjects are governed by the rules uh, uh, in this learning activity system, and the rules are things such as the course policies uh, and the design and functionality of adaptive learning systems. Uh, these individual students are also affected, uh, or um, uh, uh, not mediated, but yeah, I guess affected by the community, by their classmates and the Spanish course instructor. And another element is the division of labor, and that entails the completion of exercises in adaptive learning systems and the provision of feedback on scoring by the adaptive learning system. So the outcome of this uh, language learning activity is um, the improvement of uh, Spanish language skills and also the development of learner autonomy. So the idea here is that we looked at the uh, interactions among these different elements in the activity uh, system and the uh, potential contradictions among them. Uh, so the two research questions that guided our study uh, were, what affordances does the use of adaptive learning systems in Spanish courses provide for the development of learner autonomy? And what constraints does the use of adaptive learning systems in Spanish courses create for the development of learner autonomy? And Adolfo will talk about the research design. So in our study, we use a convergent design in which we consider quantitative and qualitative data. The qualitative data was comprised of open-ended questions that were collected in an online survey, also from semi-structured interviews. They were guided um, in two focus groups and reflective, uh, reflection journals that the students completed, and the quantitative data to, uh, derived from an online survey that we um, gave to students. Our participants included the students from four different Spanish courses. We have students in uh, semester one, Spanish 1001 here at the university, and also uh, second semester, Spanish 1002. We also have students from intermediate courses, uh, which is Spanish 1001. It will be the equivalent to the 1003, 1004 here uh, at the university. And uh, Iowa State has a bridge course for the students who are not quite prepared to jump into the uh, upper level courses, which is a Spanish 297. There's no real equivalent here at this university for that. The closest uh, that could be is Spanish 1022. Uh, but those are the four uh, courses that we consider, and we have a variation in terms of the number of participants from um, each of the courses. So as you can see, the Second semester students were the most highly motivated. We got more people uh, from that group. Can you advance to the next slide, please? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, so the materials and instruments that uh, we considered, the two adaptive and learning systems that we uh, uh, analyzed were Orion, published by Wiley, and Connect, published by McGraw-Hill. And we, the instruments to collect our data, we had an online survey that had contained two parts. Part one focused on the demographics of our population. Part two included 11 uh, Likert scale questions that asked the students to rate their agreement or disagreement in regards to their functionality and um, 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 interactions with the adaptive learning systems and the two open-ended questions focus on pros and cons so affordabilities and constraints which is what we focus on the semi-structured interviews were conducted uh, between a researcher and a student if these were one-on-one -on -one, there were two interviews conducted during the semester at week five and week 12 and we have uh, five and six participants five participants for round one six participants for round two and we use guided questions with impromptu follow-up questions that uh, were uh, to determine, to find out more information on what uh, the students were 
uh, reporting on, and this lasted between nine and 29 minutes. The two focus groups that we conducted uh, took place in week five and week 12. And in the first focus group, we have six participants and it lasted 61 minutes. And in the second one, we have five participants and it only lasted 48 minutes. We have reflective, reflection journals completed by five of the participants and uh, they were given uh, guided questions uh, to complete those. Uh, next, yeah. Um, I will next show you what was the uh, operations that the students and the interactions that the students had with the adaptive learning systems. First, let me give you a rundown of what was the workflow. Uh, it's very uh, similar to what perhaps you're currently doing in your courses. The students log into the system, they get to see a specific chapter that is being covered in the class. There are specific sections related to that particular chapter, and they have the option of completing an exercise for that particular chapter. There are variations in terms of the level of difficulty that they can uh, uh, tackle during their session. And then, um, some of the differences with the adaptive learning system, system is in regards to the type of feedback that they receive and also the number of questions that they get to complete based on their performance within the system. And I will uh, uh, explain this a little further in the next slide. I will first describe the interactivity that happened in uh, Ross, you want to advance? Mm -hmm. In the uh, adaptive learning system of Orion, uh, once the students log in, this is the type of interface that they saw when completing a, a particular question for an exercise. So as you can see, there were different forms of types of questions. So there will be fill in the blanks, drop down, uh, drag and drop, that kind of thing. Uh, they were not only receiving the question item, but they were also asked to rate their level of confidence in terms of responding or answering the question. So in here, it would ask them to choose how confident were they in their responses. Some other information that was made available in terms of feedback available to them, it showed them how difficult that question was in regards to anyone who has ever attempted to complete this question to actually get it right. So as you can see on the right side of the screen, 50% of the students have gotten this question right. So kind of a motivating factor to say if only 20% of the students have gotten it right and I got it wrong, well, I'm not too bad off since only 20% think that it right, that kind of thing. It also shows information, uh, metacognitive information with regards to what is the subject matter being covered in terms of content. So it gives them access to uh, uh, the uh, topic being covered with that question. And also performance indication, on, as you can see in the upper right corner, it shows them how many questions throughout their session they have answered correctly or incorrectly. And also it gives them, once they click on that, it gives them access to uh, in that information by chapter and also semester long uh, interactivity that they have had with the system. Uh, next slide, please. This information was dramatically different in Connect because uh, the students were asked to answer the question and also provide information in terms of their level of confidence with that question item. However, in terms of feedback, they only have uh, access to reports of people who have previously completed that question without aggregated information in terms of how many have answered it correctly or incorrectly. Um, some students reported um, um, Difficulty also interpreting that information because it only showed a number, not knowing if that meant that that is the average of that student in the course or what really referred to uh, in, in, on the screen when it was displayed on the screen. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, I will talk about the data collection procedure. Uh, so as Adolfo has already mentioned, we collected the data in uh, the spring semester of 2015 uh, over the period of 14 weeks. Um, we had two main uh, rounds of data collection. The first round took place during week, weeks five and six, kind of more towards the beginning of the semester. 
And the second round took place uh, at the end of the semester during weeks 12 and 13. Uh, so we gathered uh, online survey responses. Uh, we gathered uh, qualitative data from uh, semi-structured interviews and data from focus groups. We also gathered data from the reflect, uh, reflection journals that Adolfo mentioned earlier, but we didn't really use it because it was not informative and valuable. And we'll talk a little bit about that more in uh, the limitations. Um, so the qualitative data that we had was transcribed in, in, a, in a software called Express Scribe. Uh, then we coded it in an en vivo using a two-cycle approach, um, assigning initially descriptive codes, and then uh, the second round was entailed uh, the assignment of focused codes. Uh, the quantitative data from um, uh, survey questions uh, was analyzed uh, by calculating descriptive statistics, uh, namely the percentages of responses. And all the data, all these data were analyzed in the context of the participants' language learning activity system. Um, so our first research question, just to remind you, was about the affordances of um, using LAS for the development of learner autonomy. We found three main themes. Uh, the first one was that LAS provided, uh, in students' opinion, uh, uh, opportunities for extended practice and review. Um, students commented on such things uh, as a, a large pool of questions and multiple attempts. Uh, they were, um, uh, they thought that uh, having a large pool of questions and being able to attempt the answers multiple times um, was a positive thing for the development of their learner autonomy. Uh, the selection of questions was based on the correctness of students' uh, previous responses, and there was no time limit to complete the exercises, which uh, some students thought enabled their choice. Uh, one of the quotes from, uh, from an interview uh, came from participant five who said, I think it helped me learn grammar mostly. Uh, the assignments were very focused on a specific grammar topic, so it gives you lots of repetition and opportunities to uh, really solidify knowledge of a specific topic. It was really good in getting uh, practice with that. Uh, the second affordance was uh, adaptive learning. Uh, so the questions, the new questions were delivered based on students' uh, previous performance. So if a student, for example, provided a correct answer to an item that was uh, at a medium range of difficulty, then the next item that the uh, adaptive learning system would uh, give the students would be at a more difficult level. Um, so that's where the adaptability comes into play. Uh, it also, uh, the system also, or both systems uh, also took into account the student's confidence level for each question. So as Adolfo showed in uh, the previous slides, uh, the students were able to rate how confident they were in, the, uh, in their response and uh, the system would take into account uh, when adapting the content to uh, each individual student. Um, another participant uh, said uh, that, um, uh, the quote, uh, it's almost like a tutor that's always there. You can go to Ryan and if you're using it regularly, it's going to be very in tune with what course material that you're struggling with and be able to give you relevant material to be working on instead of just working through the content and wasting time on things you already understand and glossing over things that you don't actually understand as well. Uh, and the third affordance for the development of learner autonomy was uh, instant scores and feedback provided by adaptive learning systems. So uh, students uh, received uh, two types of feedback. Uh, they received immediate feedback on each question. Uh, specifically, the system would tell them whether the uh, answer was correct or incorrect. And students also received a report at the end of each ex exercise um, uh, that highlighted the weaknesses in the knowledge of their grammar and vocabulary. Um, so uh, in uh, one of the participants mentioned in, its, in the survey that uh, I like the idea I can get instant feedback to an incorrect response that explains why my answer was incorrect. And um, another participant said it during the interview that adaptive learning system that we use uh, gives you the report after you do a certain number of questions and tell you what you're most proficient and what you're least proficient and I use that a lot. Um, and our second research question was about the constraints and Adolfo will uh, present the results of that.
So there were some benefits from using adaptive learning systems, but there were also some challenges. And some of the constraints that we identified in the data that we collected, uh, the first one is related to scoring mechanisms built into the adaptive learner system. So some of the systems were very uh, strict in regards to what uh, a correct answer was. So for instance, if all of the, uh, the uh, characters were typing capital letters, uh, some systems did not recognize that as a correct answer. Uh, of, of course, um, accent marks were also affecting uh, the, the score that students received. More importantly, however, uh, since the adaptive learner system considers past performances, it also can knock down points based on what they start getting incorrect. So for instance, if you are just there to to try things out and not really have a study the, 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 the topic or not really paying attention and you just enter answers incorrect that are incorrect, it just starts knocking down points. And some students found that very challenging and not really understanding fully what that meant uh, for their grade. Uh, so there was uh, another uh, constraint was lack of clarity about how the actual scoring uh, was done based on the calculations uh, that the infrastructure of the system had. Um, and another uh, example from a quote, I can never receive full credit on the assignment because if I miss one answer, it puts me back really far and I have to answer two or three times more questions to get back to the point of where I was. The next slide. The second uh, constraint is in regards to feedback, as I showed you. The feedback the students had access to vary depending on the system. Some found having too much information displayed on the screen was kind of overwhelming and they not always knew how to interpret all of the information. And the more you click, so as I showed you in Orion, for instance, if you click on the chart, it will show you your performance across the board uh, within the chapter, but also across the semester and students were not always able to make the connection like, oh, I'm improving or I'm not improving within the system. Uh, so uh, another uh, constraint that the students reported was in regards to not knowing exactly how they got the answer wrong. So the, the system will tell them, you didn't get it right, try again. But they wanted to know why I didn't get it right. Uh, and that wasn't always pointed out in the feedback that they received from uh, the system. So as you can see in the quote in there. Next slide. Uh, the third constraint was just in, 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 in regards to the design of the system itself. There was a steep learning curve uh, for students learning how to navigate, first of all, into the system and also understanding the full functionalities of all the features built into the system. So there was uncertainty as to what happens if they click, you know, in some, some areas that they didn't know where it would take them. Uh, so as you can see in the quote, it was a little difficult as to where I needed to start. And this will become evident um, uh, in the limitations where I talk about some different modes that they have access to within the system that wasn't clear to them. Um, can you go to the next slide? Okay, grading policies, here we are. Um, grading policies uh, was the fourth constraint that we identified and this was uh, something that the students reported in some classes, grades. Uh, in all of the courses, the students completed the, ex the, uh, the exercises or the chapters assigning the adaptive learning system as part of the course grade. However, how, what we found out based on our interviews and focus groups and survey is that this did not was upheld in all, in all of the courses. So in some sections, uh, uh, students were getting their grades based on the actual work that they did into the system, whereas in other sections, the grades were based on whether or not they attempted to complete the exercises, which is something that we really didn't, were not expecting or counting on. We thought it was the same across the board. Next slide. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about some final um, uh, con conclusion points. Uh, so the examination of an um, 
uh, adaptive learning system mediated language learning activity system uh, helped us detect uh, both affordances and constraints of using ALS for the development of learner autonomy. Uh, we found that these affordances and constraints were affected both by the internal factors um, that came from the uh, indivi uh, from the individual dimension of language learners, as well as external factors that came from the social dimension, um, specifically from the instructor and from the um, features of the system. We also found that the digital dimension was important for the development of learner autonomy as well within the adaptive learning system, and that had to do with, uh, for example, the steep, uh, relatively steep learning curve that a number of our participants reported um, about learning how to use the adaptive learning systems. Uh, we had uh, several limitations, as uh, any research study does. Uh, one of the limitations that I mentioned earlier was uh, an issue that we had with the reflection journals. So the purpose of the reflection journals was to uh, let students express their, um, um, share their experience with uh, how they use uh, the adaptive learning system and uh, have kind of more in-depth reflection on its affordances and constraints for the development of learner autonomy. However, what we found was that the uh, all the data that we got from the reflection journals was not really valuable because the students simply described how they used the system rather than reflected on how they used it. Uh, we had only self-reported data from student participants. We didn't have the teacher's perspective, uh, so we consider that to be a limitation. Um, and our analysis focused on uh, two adaptive learning systems, Orion and Connect, without really exploring the um, differences between the two. Even though, in general, they were very similar, there were, as Adolfo showed, there were some uh, slight differences between the two systems uh, in terms of the um, how they provided feedback and how the students navigated them. Uh, uh, with regard to future research, uh, we suggest moving from exploring uh, these perceived aff affordances and constraints as perceived by the students to investigating what some researchers call affectivities, that is the dynamic actualization of affordances realized by uh, the users of these systems. Uh, that entails exploring not only the properties of adaptive learning systems that are perceived as beneficial or detrimental for the development of learner autonomy, but also uh, what individual abilities language learners and teachers can um, leverage, can capitalize on, and how they can benefit from the, uh, these beneficial properties of adaptive learning systems. Uh, and Adolfo, Adolfo will finish with some implications and recommendations for integrating adaptive learning systems in language courses. So we wanted to, we thought it would be um, um, useful to, to this group to point out what are some of the implications that it has to do in terms of the language curriculum. So as one of the findings for, uh, that we uh, have from the study, um, there needs to be consistency in terms of upholding course policies, especially in multi-section courses with regard to the adaptive learning systems in our study this proved to be a problem and a confusion that is developed. Uh, and as you know, students talk among this themselves. So finding out that Osam is giving full credit just for having them try out the system, whereas Adolfo is really being really picky about how many interface the system can create problems uh, across the board. Um, another implication is that as we discover, the learning curve may be steep and there may be great benefits associated to having a clear understanding not on how you access the information but also how the system actually works so that the students can take full advantage and receive full benefit from the system as he proved uh, in the feedback uh, functions that uh, the, the system conveys the, the information the way in which it's presented to the students it can be more beneficial for them to interpret that information so that they can make decisions on their own learning as to what materials they need to review or how much more the, uh, time they should uh, spend on the system. Finally, uh, grades uh, that derive from interactions with adaptive learning systems should not be solely based on how much time the learners spend in the system. 
uh, some of the interactions that the students have with the system can be really short. If they already know the material, they are gonna go into the system, the system is gonna check, realize that they already know the material and that they don't need to spend time working on that, but there can be other topics that they can work on to improve their learning. And that's something to take into account. We cannot assume that all students need lesson six on two in the same way as with its functionality would be able to determine. And that is all we have. We open the floor for questions and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Questions, comments, reactions? I'm, I'm curious about the student journals. And I'm wondering if you have a sample of what the writing prompts were for the students and how and if you could figure out why you didn't get the type of responses you were interested Russ, do you want to answer that? Um, yeah, if I understood your question correctly, uh, we had we, so we created individual Google documents for each student who agreed to uh, have a reflection journal. And in the, when we provided the instructions in that document saying that we would like you, uh, I think it was after each week. Um, was it after each week, Adolfo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would like you to uh, reflect on how you use the system and specifically reflect on the affordances and constraints. So uh, we thought that the prompt was clear enough and uh, that it asked them to write a reflection, not a description of what they have done. But for whatever reason, I do not know if students do not read instructions, they, they did not read the instructions, they didn't take it seriously. Uh, in retrospect, uh, I realized that it might have been uh, a good idea to talk to those students during the first interview and kind of maybe explain to them uh, what exactly, like emphasize that we wanted reflections, not descriptions. Did um, you, so, did yep. you look at their journals during the study or, or just at the end? So did you know when this was happening? We, we actually did not uh, look, uh, we, we looked at towards the end, yeah, we didn't look, we, we looked at uh, whether they were submitting journals or not. And we did actually have an issue with, with that. I think we, we had somewhere in the slides that I believe we had only five students who agreed to do the journals and there was probably only one who was kind of consistent in terms of writing the reflections. We provided monetary compensation uh, for the interviews, focus groups, and journals, and we told them that, I don't remember how much we paid, it was like a few dollars, but we told them that we would pay you for each reflection journal, and what happened is that most of those, I think five students, they wrote the majority of their reflection journals towards the end of the semester, so it wasn't really what we expected that you know, at the end of each week, they would write a reflection journal. So it was partly our fault that we, we should have, I guess, um, managed it better and controlled. And we did, I, I know that Adolfo sent them reminders saying that, oh, we see that if you haven't submitted your journal, please do. And it might also be that they focus on how much they wrote because they were paid based on full production. So they focus on more describing what they need because that really fill up the work count that was needed to get their, their money. Uh, so it could be that they focus more on what I did as opposed to what I experienced, what challenge. This is very helpful because in German this week all our students are writing yeah. their journals. We'll be happy to share. <laughs> yeah, just a quick question about the, um, the populations. Um, um, at the beginning and the end of the semester, were they the same population for your focus groups and your surveys, or were they different? Uh, for the focus groups, we had uh, three common students. So in round one, we have five students. In round two, we have six. So three were the same for, for both rounds, but the rest were, were different groups. Uh, for the um, the online service, we have the same 35 
uh, students participating, although we had uh, two that didn't complete it. They didn't complete the, the, uh, the one at the end. So everyone was at the beginning. We actually had more people who agreed to participate in the study, but the 35 that we considered for the study were precisely those that stick with it. So they did round one and round two for the online survey. Were they compensated as well? They were not compensated for completing the online survey. Only those who participated in the focus groups, in the uh, interviews, and the journal. Do you have a sense of how the importance and constraints of these adaptive systems differ than the non-adaptive systems? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. We don't have Adolfo, could you repeat the question? Yeah, do we have a sense of, of any differences between these uh, ALSs and non-ALSs and series uh, that go with textbooks? Um, yes, uh, well, one of the uh, constraints that we identified was precisely uh, having a clear understanding of how the system works. So whether or not you are using it, um, making sure that your instructors understand how this system works is paramount in, in its adoption. So for instance, in our case, we discovered that from what the students were reporting is that the instructor really didn't understand that when you enter the adaptive learning system, it may be that you only are to complete three questions and you're good because you're great. Whereas some instructors thought, wait, why is Ben only spending three minutes on this? She should be working 20 minutes a day, and we're assigning prescriptively more exercises, as opposed to taking advantage of the functionality of the system that will detect weak areas and will bring content on those weak areas that the student needs. So in other words, I think that the main difference is just conceptually whether or not, because it can be that, that you have an adaptive learning system, but you may be using it the same way as one non-adaptive, right? So it can be that in my Spanish lab, you're only assigning exercise five, seven, eight from chapter one, exercise 12, 13, 16 from chapter two, Whereas in the adaptive learning system, you only say chapter one. The system is going to analyze the weaknesses of the student and will throw content based on those needs. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess I just wondered, you know, like one of the importance, I think it was the first one that you had identified there was really like this student perception and almost confidence in there that mm -hmm. we learned this really well. Mm -hmm. And I guess I just wondered if students that have the non-adaptive systems, if they see themselves as learning that content really well. Like, is that something that's you, an importance that's unique to the, mm -hmm. the adaptive or not? Like, you know, like I, some of that thing. Yeah. I think it will be, and particularly this is particularly true for Orion, because the confidence that the students have, imagine just answering a question that the system is already telling you that only 10% of the students got right and you get it right, that's a confidence booster, right, right away. But having that uh, meta information, if that's a word, but that massive amount of information that is available to them, and also the realization that I don't need to sit and work on this for 30 minutes. I can, if I know the material, it's gonna take me five minutes, and that's okay. Um, but we didn't really study non ALS. Yeah, I guess that wasn't a focus. Yeah. I kind of want to come back to the issue of learner autonomy. Um, and it, it, it still seems as though all of these things are assigned. You need to complete this. This isn't something. It's, it's on your own. Well, you cannot have like free will in this. You still have four chapters that you cover in the semester, right? So in that sense, you limit that content that the student can have access to. 
for uh, uh, course purposes and for uh, partial quiz. The, the student can still have access to other materials. So one of the ways in which Orion, for instance, works is in terms of level difficulty, but all of the question items are tagged based on topic. And it, this can be attached to a grammatical point or to a uh, just a content topic. So for instance, if you're working with direct object pronouns in chapter three, if a student already got it down pretty good, the system starts throwing items that are in chapter 12, direct objects, but are related to a different topic. So in that sense, they get that um, um, functionality in terms of it's not really restricted to a chapter or to a, a particular topic. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm still probably confused in terms of how we're using the term autonomy. If, if I mean, do you have any sense that students went off and explored stuff on their own in these systems, or is that not what you're looking? At? Yeah, uh, no, that's not what we were looking at. So we didn't have access to the actual logs of activity. Uh, that's not what we consider. We did have access, but that's not what we consider. For this study, we haven't really looked at that information uh, on how much time they spent and what uh, chapters they used uh, or they reviewed. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, if I understood the the question from the audience correctly, I guess the the concern. Um, uh, I believe you're asking whether. So one of the things that we talked about uh, at the end, I think, in the Directions for Future Research is that in our, our study, looked, we looked at learner autonomy as perceived by the students. Uh, so our investigation of learner autonomy was based on how the students perceived the adaptive learning systems, the constraints and the affordances of the adaptive learning system for the development of their learner autonomy. We didn't really have we didn't gather hard evidence of whether they were developing learner autonomy, if that makes sense. It was how they were perceiving it, as opposed to what evidence is there that their learner autonomy is being developed. But that, that presupposes they have a concept of learner autonomy and that they have a positive idea about it, that it's something to be... Correct, yes. And I, I, should, I should know that we didn't use the, uh, the term learner autonomy in our interviews and focus groups. We, we had questions that, that basically were about learner autonomy without using the word learner autonomy. I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about grades as a potential constraint or affordance in contributing to students' perception of their learner autonomy. And have you guys problematized that at all? Have you, have you thought about the role of grades in students' reactions to the ALS and their use of it? Yeah, well, what we reported, that was one of the constraints that we identified. Uh, so first, the students uh, being uh, dissatisfied with the fact that some instructors did not uh, accept the fact that they could, it could mean for them that they would need to spend three minutes on the task and be in receive full credit. I'm thinking of it differently, though. I'm thinking of grade, being graded on this versus not being graded on this. So oh, yeah. is, is that a potential affording or something contributing to their perceived learning time? Yeah. We don't have data to speak to that. However, during the uh, individual interviews, within our ion, you have the option of entering the adaptive learning system for a grade or for the study. So they have the practice mode in which you would just go and study without any grades being reported to the instructor. And you have the option of doing it 
uh, uh, for practice mean you will your grades will be reported to the instructor. So I think that might be something that uh, can help answering your question. Just having the ability to freely access something without thinking in terms of grade wise, how is this going to affect me, right? Right, but they just—they may not use it. Then. They may not yeah. use it. They did use it yeah. during the uh, the interviews. They did report using the uh, the practice mode because it helped them develop a level of confidence. Uh, and then when they felt ready, they would go into the study mode to actually complete the exercises because the question items were similar. Uh, the grades were just not being reported. So. They, it could be that they would spend 10 minutes on practice mode, just building up their confidence, and then, boom, going to the study mode, it would take them three minutes to complete and get everything right. I have an idea of doing this. Uh, just about a year ago, it's a new tool in our system. Uh, uh, we didn't tell the students that we didn't have any points. Uh, on the third, the third module, someone asked, so how many points does it have? And they said, no, there are no points. And after that, it was the same amount of reduction, even though it didn't have any points. So they think it must have seen some value in it, right? So because it was the same amount of students that were doing it the first, the first three, they can do it after finding out that it was not weighted. Yeah, we can um, have that kind of information on how many use the practice mode. Um, but it, it, it's something that can be looked into. In our case, we couldn't ask people to do it still. That was kind of easy. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you worked over one semester with the orals before the funding results. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the the feed, the variation in terms of feedback really uh, was more. The differences were marked by again their understanding on the part of the instructor in regards to the functionality of the system, and also they themselves what kind of training they were provided. So, for instance, some of the sections uh, instructors. Um, embedded uh, training videos in Moodle as to how to go about completing the assignments. And those students were more satisfied than those who didn't have access to training information or in regards to the functionality of the system. Other marked differences was uh, where in regards to the two systems, so Connect and, uh, and Orion, People who use Connect were less satisfied in regards to the amount of feedback they received. They wanted more information, they wanted more specific information. And they reported being more confused by what, what kind of information they were receiving. So as you saw on the, on, the, on the screen that they only have access to actual users of the system as opposed to aggregated forms of information. I think we're going to have to end now. Right, your class outside, but let us all give thanks to.